ladies and gentlemen, all over the United States, there are trials being conducted, little trials, large trials, civil cases, criminal cases, with juries who are independent, sit in the jury box, listen to the facts, listen to the judge who is also independent, go into a jury room, decide what the verdict is, and then come out. These lectures are a chance for us to think about how that system evolved. And it's the history of jury trials, but it's also the history, to some extent, of thought. It's also the history of political science. Because when society cannot figure out what to do with a problem, in Western civilization, they have for a long time had a jury trial to try to determine it. We're going to start way back 2,500 years ago, and as we fly over to that period, we fly over a lot of trials that have occurred and that you'll hear about in this series of lectures. We will uh, fly over the trial of Galileo, for example, Thomas More, and others, and go back to the beginning. The beginning, uh, symbolically, for Western civilization was with the Greeks. There are arguments one can make that uh, trials uh, were used in other places and in other ways. But for us, the Greeks are the starting point. And the Greeks invented law. They invented law from custom. Custom grew up after people left the caves and began to trade with each other. There had to be a way to resolve disputes. If you are to trade, you can get into a dispute. If you can get into a dispute, there must be rules. And there were rules of commerce, simple rules at the beginning. And they were resolved by the merchants, by the traders on the trails. And then came the Greeks. And as we can never quite say what it is that causes a people to be interested in freedom, in particular, either when it starts or when it stops, because these trials I'm going to talk to you about in this series deal with both the beginning and the ending of democracies, and also, of course, in the middle. We can never quite tell why these things start. But the Greeks had, as we will now see, a form of democracy that was exhilarating uh, for Americans in the last part of the 20th century to realize when the Greeks had a political problem, they all got together in a common area to decide what would be done. They liked that procedure. Plato later criticized that procedure. He thought that was bad. Hobbes didn't like that much. He thought that was just getting a gang of people together. You couldn't control it. But the Greeks loved it, and they used it in many different ways. And then, as disputes would arise, they began the practice of having a place where you could go to solve the dispute. And in the beginning, they would solve a dispute by having the two participants, if there were two, talk back and forth about their various positions. As this proceeded, you were allowed to bring a friend who could make a speech for you. These friends were the first lawyers. They didn't charge a fee. Think of it. They did not <laughs> charge a fee. This is the beginning of the law. We, we, we want to dwell on this. We want to understand how this happened. But I can tell you how it happened. It happened in an interesting way. You can still see the traces of it in England. The only people that could be lawyers were people who had their own estates. The, the, the very wealthy in the community by those standards. Those were the people that could afford to, to make up speeches. It was unethical in the early Greek days to accept a fee. And those who were good at this, of course, were asked by more people to prepare speeches. And thus, this slowly evolved the concept of the lawyer who went to court, the trial lawyer. These early trials in the Greek system would not allow everybody to testify. Slaves, for example, could not testify. That problem lasted all the way into the 19th century, because we had people who were identified as people who could not go to court and testify. So they didn't have complete democracy, but they did invent the idea of law for our purposes. And their concept was to resolve things in a place without violence and without excess power by the executive or by leaders. This is a breathtaking idea. This is the beginning of democracy. And you'll forgive my bias that I think trials are so important. 
But if you can have a courthouse and people are allowed to go there and argue with each other about important matters and the press is allowed to cover it, then you probably have a robust and vigorous democracy. And as a matter of fact, when we get to the end of these lectures, I will suggest to you that where you find the jury trials, you find robust democracy. But there was never more robust democracy than there was in the early classical Greek period. And uh, as they worked in the time of Pericles in the 400s, 400 BC, Pericles did a great many things. But he also sponsored uh, the law and saw it as something that could be tolerated, even though he was a leader. He was a good example of a leader who didn't have an antipathy to allowing people to resolve disputes in the legal process. And then, ladies and gentlemen, came Socrates. And Socrates was brilliant. Socrates was a person who uh, had distinguished himself in fighting in various battles. Uh, he was in three military expeditions during the Peloponnesian War. And uh, it was at Delium that he distinguished himself for his courage. He was a questioner, something we will see can get you in trouble in this world and can get you into trials even where your life is at stake if you question authorities, if you question what is currently the fashion. And of course, Socrates not only questioned, but to this day we say Socratic method, particularly as used in law schools, to mean a system by which Socrates used to question everything. Now, people who question everything may be great in the construction of Western civilization, but they are a very big pain. Uh, to question everything is tiring. And it irritates those who do not wish to question everything, and especially irritates those who are in authority and do not wish to be questioned. Socrates questioned everything. So they brought him up on trial, and they summoned a jury. And in those days, they picked juries in this way. And here you see the robust nature of their democratic form. They would gather 6,000 potential jurors from their community, much broader than the Romans were to do. The Romans were a class-structured society who used senators, as we will see in a moment. But the Greeks called 6,000, and they did that by die-casts. They were referred to as die-casts. The die is cast. That meant you were one of the 6,000. And you might, uh, we don't know, but you might have an excuse that you had to work that day or you had a problem, all the things that American jurors like to do. But they would summon 6,000 as potential jurors. And then by lot, they would pick 500 jurors for a case. A tremendous uh, use of the resources of the community to resolve a dispute. 500 is an incredible number. It's also a number that can be moved by passion. Uh, it is a number of people, as we will see when we get to the Roman structure, that is susceptible to some kind of corruption because there are so many that someone could go to them and give them money or influence them in some way. Uh, it, but it is a tremendous statement about the strength of a democratic model as used by the early Greeks. The irony of uh, Socrates' trial was it was precisely the democratic system that he abhorred. He really didn't care for it. He really didn't like it. And it was quite fashionable. And this is the first person that we will see who starts off to challenge a system, gets caught up in the system, and as we will see, eventually becomes a symbol of the reverse of what he attacked, because he eventually becomes a symbol, uh, a democratic symbol, as someone who should be left alone. This is a, now a tradition in Western civilization, and Socrates certainly was part of that. Socrates was the first prototypical difficult client. I must say, I say that as a lawyer. He was impossible. He not only questioned, but he would listen to the answers, but he, then he would do exactly what he wanted to do. There were available in 
those times some marvelous lawyers that could have represented him. Lysias was thought to be the best and was available to defend Socrates because this was a big trial in those times. Um, Xenophon, whose works are still available, was one of the great orators. Socrates would have none of this. These speeches they prepare, he said, are too beautiful. Also, I have reached an age where I have nothing to look forward to but infirmities and loss of memory. I will learn less, said Socrates, and I will remember it less. And so why should I fight for this? All of this put in the form of questions to a despairing collection of supporters who are trying to talk him out of this. In great contrast, I must say, in order to lighten our loads here, to the piece done by Cicero many years later on old age, which is a wonderful piece about how one can learn in the older years and how uh, it, it holds many great advantages. And as we will see, jumping ahead for a second, Cicero didn't make that because they assassinated him, but we'll get back to that. Socrates uh, is brought up on trial, and the precise charges are not recognizing the gods whom the state recognizes. We will see a lot of that over the 2,500 years uh, that we will discuss. And corrupting the youth, by which they meant, not, not what we might immediately think of in this day, but by which they meant raising questions that caused the youth to think things that the management didn't like. And that's what they didn't like. 399 BC, they're in Athens. There are observers. Xenophon was not at the trial, although he's one of our main sources of what happened there. It has to be hearsay to him, but Plato also gave an account and was in attendance. The procedures are the 500 jurors, the prosecutor Melitos, and the prosecutor was not our form of prosecutor where we have a district attorney and her staff located somewhere and they prosecute every day, but rather some lawyer who has taken offense or some person who has taken offense brings a criminal case and Melitos spoke and attacked Socrates on these two charges. Socrates uh, was a political prisoner, the first of the great political cases. We can think of him you know, we've had the Chicago 7, and we've had the Hartford 5, or whatever, and now we can think of Socrates as the Athens 1. He was a political prisoner in a, a criminal case, uh, a, a grouch, as I have said, someone that irritated them, but surely someone who could get off without much difficulty if he handled it right. Like everything else in his life, he questioned whether he really wanted to get out, to get off. And he treated the trial with contempt, in part because of his philosophy. I.F. Stone has written a wonderful book on this subject, which I commend to you, which he captures the fact that Socrates is opposed to all this democracy, and now he's looking at a trial, which is a democratic function, and he doesn't like that. So he starts off, and they have a trial not in the form that we recognize it, but a, a series of arguments back and forth, and they argue the various merits of what has occurred. And then, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for a vote on whether Socrates should be held liable. And there are two phases. First, is he, is he guilty? And secondly, um, should there be a penalty, and if so, what should the penalty be? Well, he's really accused of thought and talking and thinking. He's a precursor of Galileo. He is a person who has not only the ability to think, which many people do, but he says it out loud. He's sort of the first free speech captive. Uh, he's a lot of things in our, in our way of thinking. And it's worth focusing on him. But he, he is not like any of the others that we will find, people who want to succeed in this trial. And he is arrogant. And the jury knows it. They have a vote on liability, which is 220 for Socrates, 
but 280 against him. So he has lost on the question of liability. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the question of penalty. And here is the most amazing penalty phase in any trial that you will ever hear about. The prosecutor asks for death. As I read the authorities, they had to do that. But the defendant can offer an alternative. And if it's a reasonable alternative, given the vote of 220 to 280, you would think that they would approve it. Socrates seizes the moment in a negative way, attacks the jury and the process, insults everyone back and forth, and announces that the penalty he should receive, he should be declared a national hero. A, a, uh, a, a statue should be constructed with regard to him, and everyone should understand that he is the wisest person in all of Greece. Bad timing, Socrates. Uh, we will think a little bit in these lectures about how to argue and when to argue, uh, the, the rhetoric of it all, very bad timing. Now, the vote on penalty. Remember, these are the same people. 360 for death, 140 for uh, basically letting Socrates go. Xenophon has a slightly different uh, rendition of what happened there. He says that Socrates just asked for no penalty, but he wasn't there, and Plato's version is probably more accurate that he asked to be a civic hero. So there's a swing of 80 people who thought he wasn't guilty of anything, but after hearing him talk about himself and the penalty, they want him dead. <laughs> this trial is out of control. Uh, Socrates, you can see in the painting of David, because uh, in France and in Western civilization, they took great intellectual nourishment in the last century and before in the classics. And I, I looked again at that painting. Socrates is sitting there, and he's pointing. He's looking very relaxed. And everyone else is in a state of anguish, for they are about to lose their teacher. And the relationship between teacher and student can be a very strong one. And Socrates was a great teacher, so he, as he taught us all. That's why he's still discussed and why one can purchase Plato's recollections of Socrates in paperback in our country, in America, at this time, was that he was a great teacher. And he was a great thinker. He was all of those things. He wasn't a great trial lawyer. <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, he had no lawyer, but he could have, and I stress that. It wasn't that the system didn't provide it. It was that his ego didn't allow it, and his political view didn't allow for anybody to step in and just make a pretty speech, as he would think of it. He had to drink the poison, and, if, uh, and he did, and uh, that was the end of Socrates. But it was not the end of Greek culture which uh, abounded in this period. The uh, Parthenon was constructed. You can see it in your mind's eye, a fantastic building, great columns. This was a civilization that was finding out what was possible in this world, and they were doing it on a democratic model. They cared about what their fellow citizens thought, and they had techniques to allow them to articulate their thoughts, and they believed that that would make a stronger society. They did great sculpture. Uh, it was uh, an idealized sculpture. To this day, uh, it supplies uh, nourishment for uh, sculptors and others. The heroic sculpture of that period uh, was admired by Michelangelo and Rodin, two very different uh, sculptors and artists. and. Uh, they were a society worth thinking about, worth knowing more about. The uh, late classical period was between 400 and 323 BC, and uh, they did develop a form of portraiture, uh, which was important in that a person could be portrayed uh, in their art. Socrates uh, would have to be portrayed by Plato and thought about by others as time went by. 
and he became a symbol. And I want to introduce that concept for you now because, as we will see in these lectures, as Socrates is a symbol, as Thomas More is a symbol, uh, as others became symbols, a symbol is not exactly the person. We know this from Jung, who is the definitive writer on symbols, but every trial lawyer knows that there are symbols and people react to the symbols. Socrates is the symbol, one of them, in Western civilization of the free thinker who sits down on a given day and thinks to himself, I will think about problems and if they take me somewhere different than my neighbor, I will articulate them anyway. All of this led to Demosthenes and Demosthenes um, gave no promise at the beginning of being what he was to become. As a young man, he was cheated out of his estate by his uncles. His father had died. There were supposed to be 3,000 uh, talons there for him. There was much less than that, maybe a tenth of that. And as I've described the system to you, he could go to court and argue that he should get this money but he had several serious problems. The one that was the most serious, not only did he look frail at this time, he was in his teens, he was 17 years of age, but nobody could really be comfortable listening to him because he had a raspy voice and a lisp and it was painful for him to talk. But he wanted to go to court, he wanted to get his money and he was inspired by witnessing one of the trials in Athens, and he determined that he would do whatever it took to educate himself and train himself to become an orator who could go to court and get the money from his uncles. And then he did something that made every student in the last century sad because they were told by their teachers that Demosthenes was someone they should imitate and live up to. And he was so intense and he was so serious that very few, I imagine, of the students of the last century could really live up to Demosthenes and they must have been filled with sadness because here's what he did. He decided that he'd have to find a place where he would learn to speak. Now if you can speak in that civilization, you can do a lot of things because that civilization, of course, had as methods of communication, writing and speaking, but speaking was terribly important. He found a cave that was close to the Aegean and he began to practice speaking. He had weak lungs. He had none of the natural abilities that you might find in a 17-year-old boy who was destined to become a great speaker. He would put marbles in his mouth and practice speaking. Whether he would ever swallow any of these is not known. We simply don't know whether that happened. We hope it didn't because that would be quite painful and could be a real setback. He was afraid that he would not have the strength and courage to continue and so he shorn off half his hair, half his hair, a subject which in my case for those who are in audio is an amazing thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Demosthenes began to practice day in and day out. He stood in front of the waves of the Aegean and practiced speaking. He did that for a long time. He had shorn off half his hair because he didn't want to go back into town until he was ready. And after a while, he was ready. And in, three, uh, in 364, the trial of a Phobos which had to do with his money and his uncles. After two years of preparation, and he had just reached the age of 20, he went into court and he accused his uncles of embezzling the monies of the orphan Demosthenes. There was a verdict for Demosthenes and he had won his first case. This young man who could not speak in a way that people would listen to would become the voice of Greek democracy because in democracies as in other political systems there is a beginning there is a middle and there is an end and it happened that Demosthenes was born in the end 
of this particular uh, civilization. Demosthenes began to try cases for his, his friends, one kind or another. It's a long and interesting uh, series of trials that he had. He also participated in political activities, and Greece was threatened by Macedon, by Philip, by Alexander, and Demosthenes spoke out, and he rallied um, the people of Greece against Philip and Alexander. He did so courageously. He also fought, fought in several battles. He was a leader uh, in that sense, and he was much beloved and supported by the people of Greece, especially those who favored democracy. But uh, Alexander the Great was a formidable force, as was his father Philip, and the Greeks began to lose, and Demosthenes could not adjust, as others did, to the concept of the loss of their democracy, of their independence, of their ability to call people together and decide problems, of all these good things. And in the trial of Tessaphone, he spoke for Greek democracy in a way that would be admired by American lawyers and by others in history, and students would be required to read. The charges can be simply put. Eschinus uh, was indicted, and there were three, three points. Uh, and Sisyphon uh, was really the main defendant here. False allegations by Sisyphon, and the allegation that he had made, he had said Demosthenes was a great citizen. And Eschinus, who was bringing this case, accused Sisyphon of making a false statement, which was that Demosthenes was a great person. Secondly, Sisyphon hadn't made the proper reports. Kind of sounds like a, a, a sort of a niggling case that might be brought today against a politically unworthy person. And uh, then some technical things to do with uh, the particular symbols that had to be used in connection with the papers involved. And the main charge that Eschinus brought against Sisyphon was an attack on Demosthenes. 330 BC in Athens, citizens came from all over the country to hear this trial. Eschinus, who was the prosecutor and main speaker, was thought to be number two as an orator in Greece. Demosthenes was number one. And they used to number their orators in those days. The Athenians had already lost their liberties on the battlefield. The jury was called and composed of 500 citizens, as it was the case of Socrates. They argued the question of Demosthenes and his position, and Eschinus was a person who uh, had collaborated with the Macedonians, and Demosthenes spoke in his final argument. When I consider that profusion of words which you have lavished, he's talking about Aeschinus, on this prosecution, I am tempted to believe that you engaged in it to display the skillful management of your voice, not to bring me to justice. But it is not language, Aeschinus, it is not tone of voice which reflects honor on a public speaker, but such a conformity with his fellow citizens in sentiment and interest that both his enemies and friends are the same with those of his country. He accuses Eschinus of treason, of taking bribes, of leaving the people. He says it is better to speak out for your liberties and die than to conform. Better read than dead, as we said years ago, some people said. And he says, better dead than Macedonian. So says the Mosthenes. When the trial is over, the vote, by the way, uh, Eschinus got less than 100 votes out of the 500. Demosthenes, once the young boy who could not speak, is the personification of a democratic dream. 
Those in the audience must know that the days of the Greek democracy are coming to a close. And that adds particular spice to it. Why do we know about this? We know about it, ladies and gentlemen, because history will use what it needs at the time. That's why artists go in and out of fashion. That's why analysis of political figures in the past are sometimes current and sometimes not. Years later, many, many centuries later, when Europe was beginning to think about democracy, they went back to Demosthenes to see what it was that was involved. And he became the scourge of the young students who were required to read uh, what this man had done. That is, way, that is the way that the Greek democracy ends. And Demosthenes becomes the prototypical constitutional lawyer. This lawyer, uh, and there have been many in England, in Ireland, in the United States, who will stand and deliver at times of great controversy, is a person worthy of attention. His death occurs in a way that I want to mention to you because it also shows you what the enemies thought of him. Antiphone, who took over for uh, Alexander the Great, was finally in the year 322 in a position of total military control of Greece and could attack Athens and wipe it out if he chose. The Athenians sued for peace. He said he would spare Athens on one condition. Give me Demosthenes. That tells us, ladies and gentlemen, that the trial lawyer was the last major voice for the democratic programs in Greece. He uh, escaped, went to an island, and eventually drank poison. And that was the end of Greek democracy, the year 322 BC. But it wasn't the end of Greek civilization. It wasn't the end of Greek art, um, which is displayed in many ways that we enjoy. The Hellenistic period went from 323 to 31 BC. And during that period, the Greeks produced much good art and other things. The one of the most uh, famous pieces is uh, Winged Victory, or the, the Nike, which is in the Louvre in Paris, a magnificent piece that you've probably seen either in person or pictures of. And so there was great artistic activity, and it was to the latter stages of this great civilization in the year 79 BC that Cicero came to be a student. He was 27. No weak voice here, no bad lungs, no cave activity, just a man destined, as he would say if he was here, destined to be a leader in his country and to be a trial lawyer. Ladies and gentlemen, if Cicero were here today and I were interviewing him as they use on television these days, tell me, Cicero, uh, you know, I'd ask him a few of the rumors first, as they always do, and then I'd say, were you the greatest trial lawyer? He would certainly say yes. Um, he would, in fact, he would say it before I asked him the question. He might say it at, during the introduction period. He was a man of immense ego, but he was also a man whose accomplishments may have outrun his ego. So we take a look at this uh, man when he was young, born in the equestrian class. And what class you were in in Rome was crucial. The equestrians were just below the senators. It was a high class, but not the highest. And at 16, his father moved to Rome. He, he uh, was tutored by the best orators in Rome at that time. Uh, he was born, I should say, in 106 BC, about 60 miles southeast of Rome. He studied the civil law. He studied literature, uh, Greek uh, poetry. He was taught by Archias, the, the Greek poet, 79 BC, as I say, he went to Athens and Asia Minor and the island of Rhodes. He studied philosophy. He studied rhetoric. Uh, later in court, he would speak not only in Latin but in Greek. And in, at Syracuse in the prosecution of Verus, he gave his entire argument in Greek because that was the fashion at that place. 
He studied theater and he knew about theater. And when I say that he studied poetry, I'll tell you one more thing about this gigantic personage. At the time that he was the best trial lawyer in Rome, he was at the same time the best poet. Of all the philosophers that wrote in the Roman times, and I must say, in fairness, to put this in perspective, the Romans were not known for their philosophy. They weren't known for their contemplative nature. But of all the, the philosophers that, that there were, Cicero has produced as much as any of them in the way of philosophy. He had a, a tremendous uh, intelligence and a curiosity about every aspect of his, of his world. Rome at this time was a formidable and scary place. When Roman armies marched, the earth shook. Their sculptures, uh, their busts of the ideal Romans are still to be seen today in pictures and indeed in person, although they will occasionally be missing a nose or other part. And they celebrated in their art themselves. A lot of art is self-celebratory in any culture, and it, so it was true in Rome. And I think Cicero, as you can see, celebrated himself immensely as he went through uh, life. The Romans were somewhat brutal in political battles, and uh, during the period that Cicero lived, from 106 B.C. down into the latter part uh, of that particular century, the next century. During that whole period, there were tremendous upheavals. For example, Spartacus, the slave, led the famous uprising. It's been in a movie. And uh, the, the Roman Republic, which again was a democracy, was beginning to move towards an empire which would be uh, dictated to from, by uh, the top rather than the old and uh, lovingly referred to in this literature, the old democratic uh, methods. A couple of points about Rome and its legal system. One, the Greeks invented law, but the Romans systematized it as they systematized their roads, as they systematized their, their living uh, accommodations, and indeed the part of the world that they that they had. They were basically engineers. They knew how to build. They knew how to carry water great distances. They knew how to build roads that chariots could go on. They did that with the law. They, up to this point in history, developed the most comprehensive system of laws. Some of it is incredible to our modern eyes. Uh, it was built around the father of the family. The family was very important and generated a lot of the law, but the father was very important. It was a male-dominated society, and the father had was given tremendous uh, authority at home, even up to the point of being allowed to kill one of the family members if the father decided that was deserving. Though the actual use of that power was fairly rare, but I give it to you by way of example. The Romans, of course, were also great traders, and they developed a law of commerce. In this environment, um, Cicero tried his first case. There are a lot of stories about the first case of trial lawyers, but nobody in the history of trial law ever took as courageous a position as Cicero in his first trial. And the trial involved a jury of 400 uh, senators, and notice, ladies and gentlemen, that they are senators. The senators are gathered from the senatorial class, and they are picked somewhat by random and brought in for the purpose of this trial. This is not very democratic by our standards, and not very democratic by the Greek standards, which we just left. But it was a form of democracy. It was public. It was open. And Cicero was hired to uh, defend uh, Rosius, R-O-S-C-I-U-S, and uh, he was charged with uh, murder. Now, the murder he had not done. 
This is very fortunate for a defense lawyer. This is always very nice. It helps and uh, can actually affect the outcome of the case. <laughs> and uh, it, we're not talking about whether it be proved or unproved, which is an idea we'll get to later, which is a whole different thing. But uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about a murder case in which the defendant didn't do it, but the person who did, Chrysagonus, was the second most powerful man in Rome, and he was the favorite of Sulla, who was the head of Rome at that time. And Cicero got up, looked at the 400 senators, and said, but I must warn you, there is a particular possibility which we have to face. I refer to the possibility that we shall not be able to persuade Chrysagonus to be content with seizing all our property. He may want to make an attempt on our lives as well. Now I return to the golden name of Chrysagonus beneath which the whole gang has surreptitiously taken shelter. Gentlemen, here I am in difficulty, says the 27-year-old lawyer. For when I speak of this man, I don't know how far I ought to go. But equally, I don't feel I can say nothing at all. If I say nothing, I leave out a very important part of my argument. But if I refer to him, I am afraid that not only Chrysagonus himself, I do not mind about that, but others, here he's talking about Sulla, may consider themselves insulted. What am I to do, says the 27-year-old trial lawyer, standing in front of 400 Roman senators, all of whom have to live with Sulla, and he wants his client acquitted, although Chrysagonus, Sulla's favorite, did the murder. He wins. Nothing about Cicero's life was ever normal. He defended his former teacher, Archius, later, who was charged with not being a citizen, he defended him on this grounds, a humble grounds indeed, as you will see. I, Cicero, stand before you. I am great. You can see how great I am. I am learned in all the fields. I have written in everything. Who taught me? Archius. And he points to the, to the small participant in this great drama, by the way, the defendant, the teacher. Look at me. I'm fantastic. He told me every, he taught me everything. Archius was granted his citizenship. He won most of the cases that he argued. He had a high percentage of wins in his criminal cases. He charged great fees. We want to come back to that subject. He had seven villas that he was able to get. And then, as though he had lived his whole life to imitate Demosthenes, as the republic began to crumble, and Cicero, and you have to like him for this, spoke out, as he did when he was 27, when he was 64, and he spoke out for the preservation of the democracy. Crossing the Rubicon, ladies and gentlemen, which is still referred to occasionally, meant bringing troops into Rome. That was against the Constitution. It was Cicero who knew the law. It was Cicero who spoke. It was Cicero who received a death warrant for his activities. This great man, who had been consul in Rome, who had been a leader there, received a death warrant. He tried to flee. He went to his summer home, the place of his childhood. He was apprehended by a crowd who carried the death warrant. He was being carried in one of these um, things in which there's a little tent there, and he's inside. He told his servants to leave so they would not be hurt. He knew it was the end. He stuck his head out and looked, and at the head, and this is known, at the head of the group that's come to get him is a former client of his for whom he had gotten an acquittal. The man had been charged with killing his father, Polybus. This we're not sure about, but it makes a good story. So I warn you, it may or may not have been true, that Cicero's last words were, Ah, Polybus, have you come to thank me for your acquittal? And with that, they struck off Cicero's head and his hands, they were taken to the forum, which had been the scene of so many of his triumphs, they were nailed to the wall for all to uh, either look at or avert their eyes. And the legacy, ladies and gentlemen, to European thought was incredible. The legacy uh, included the creation of a Ciceronian 
group in the 16th century headed by Cardinal Bembo, that's B-E-M-B-O, a society of literati bound its members by oath not to use any words not found in Cicero. You couldn't say anything that Cicero hadn't said. If he didn't say it, it wasn't worth saying. This was the sway that he had in the 16th century in Europe to say nothing of his own times. Erasmus, who comes in and out of these lectures, by the way, by happenstance, great friend of Thomas More, Erasmus was very upset with this because he wanted Latin to continue to be a, a living language in Europe, and he thought that was politically very important, and he attacked this, this very idea. Ladies and gentlemen, Cicero said, one's memory, too, must be capable of retaining a host of precedents, indeed the complete history of past times. An incredible, passionate trial lawyer devoted to learning the life of the mind that uh, we end with in this first lecture. Thank you.